Let's stand and worship together. Let's lift our voices this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. Death is to 
on, let's sing this one more time. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. darkness closes in on every side when battles rage and when the waters rise I fear no evil for I know the truth nothing can separate my heart from you there's no weapon stronger than yours no weapon stronger than come on declare it out no high no death can overcome cause there's no weapon stronger than your love oh there's nothing stronger let's sing this together Say that faith can make the mountain move, and nothing is impossible for you to clear. I fear no evil, for I know the truth. Nothing can separate my heart from you. There's no weapon stronger than. stronger than your love. No height, no death can overcome, cause there's no weapon stronger than your love. A mighty fortress, a shield around me, the power of heaven in your mighty hand. You go before I forever stand Oh, I'll forever stand Oh, we declare your love is great Your love is strong It's stronger than my man's Oh, there's no weapon Come on, sing it out And there's no stronger than your love there's no weapon stronger than your love no high no death can overcome cause there's no weapon stronger than your love there's no weapon stronger than A shield around me, the power of heaven in your mighty hand. You go before me, you won my victory, and in this promise I forever stand. nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. you 
my sin not in part but the Can we just raise our hands to God? Can we just raise our hands to God? In one hand, we hold celebration. In the other hand, we hold suffering. And we lift them both up to you, God. We lift up to you the thanks, and the gratitude, and the praise, and the honor, and the glory. We thank you, not just for what you promised, but who you are, who you've been, who you'll continue to be. We look to you continually. We look to you for salvation, to show us what love is, to prove to us again that your love is greater than anything else, is more powerful than any other message. Sometimes we doubt God and we believe that those with power say different things. Some, sometimes we get confused and we think that the loudest person or the most popular story, or the ways that we feel are more powerful. But we are brought back to you and your word, the life of Jesus, the songs we sing, and we are reminded only your love can make us well. Only your message, only your salvation, only your presence with us, only your kingdom come in this earth as it is in heaven. And we do look forward to the day when the clouds roll back like a scroll and the Lord descends, making all things new, righting the wrongs, 
As your word says, coming on a white horse with a robe dipped in blood. And it's not dipped in the blood of people. It's not dipped in the blood of your creation or those of us who have gotten things wrong. It's dipped in the blood of Christ. Defeating the powers of darkness and hell and the grave. And with hope we hold up that hand of celebration next to the one that is filled with suffering. The very real one that many of us feel and wear like a coat sometimes. And we're reminded of the anxiety. We're reminded of the sadness and the grief that Christ felt. From standing in front of a tomb to kneeling in a garden. How he looked over his city and he cried and he wept knowing that they would not choose the way of love. We hold this suffering, which feels too much like a part of who we are sometimes. We hold it up to you, our God. And the words of Christ, we ask you to take it from us. We know that you're with us in the suffering. We know that you take suffering and you bring redemption. We look at these scriptures, the one that we read this morning about how nothing can separate us from your love. We also look at the scriptures that say you make all things new and the scriptures that say for all things will work together for good. And it's a promise that even though the sufferings of this world are real, we have great evidence, great hope, great support from Scripture that you bring purpose to suffering. And the very thing that we're suffering through right now, you're going to use in a redeeming way. You save us from the suffering. And we hold it up to you in worship. We hold it up beside the thankfulness and the faith and the celebration to you. And because you're God and we are not, with confidence we can say it as well. With confidence we can say we trust you. With faith-fueled confidence, we look to you and not to ourselves. And we thank you. We thank you that things that we've prayed for have been addressed by your grace. We thank you, God. We thank you for the folks who have been released from the hospital recently, who are healing from divorce, not divorce, sorry, healing from pneumonia. God, we thank you for the marriages that are on their way to divorce that are seeking help and seeking your healing. We thank you, God, for even for some of us who are in the middle of our grief that we can be among your people and be lifted up. Because that's what your church does. It promises healing, God. And we love you and we trust you. With bold declaration, we say, you're God. In the name of Jesus, we pray, God's strong son. Amen. Before you're seated, let me remind you of a couple things. First thing I want to remind you of is what we're doing today in church is we're here for one reason, and that's to worship the Lord. And taking time to slow down and to sing and to pray and even to be quiet together. I don't know any other place but the Church of Jesus that does this regularly. Where we focus ourselves to a God who is not us, 
See, a lot of times we, 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 we gather in places that are filled with more of us and we celebrate and we rejoice over people like us. And that's not wrong, but it's not this. That's not worship of God. I like sports and concerts just like anybody else, but it's not this. This is different. This is turning all of my attention and all my affection towards God and worshiping this God by the emptying of myself, purposefully making it not about me. What an, what, what an unhuman <laughs> thing for us to do. The second thing I want to remind you of is that sitting around you is the church of Jesus and all of her splendor and majesty and glory and, 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 and messiness. There are people sitting around you today who are grieving, who are going through loss. There are people sitting around you today who have tried church before and for some reason they're giving it another try today. There are people sitting around you who have been hurt in religious places who, have, who are experiencing real, like, almost trauma when they, when they engage in their faith. There are cynics. There are doubters. There's some angry people here. There are people who just recently dried up the tears so that they felt like they could get out in public again. And that is the church of Jesus, this beautiful conglomerate of people who don't have it all together, but who gather together to pay attention to Jesus and to worship together. So before you turn around and say hello to someone, before you sit down in those comfortable seats that are there, remember these things. Remember those around you. You don't know what they walked in with, and they don't know what you walked in with. And let's freely give grace. Let's freely give grace to the person that we thought ignored us when we came in today. Let's freely give grace to the person who may be sitting in what is usually our seat or taking our parking spot. This is the church of Jesus. We come here to empty ourselves so that his spirit may fill us again. Because his mercies are new every morning. Amen. Turn around and say hey to somebody. Greet them in the name of Jesus. And if they don't act like an extrovert, don't make them become one. I literally just saw somebody punch another person on the arm. I don't know where that goes as a hug, but I guess it works for some people. Go ahead and have a seat. I want to invite our team down. They're going to receive God's tithes, our offerings. I got a couple reports for you. This thing that we do with giving is also worship. We, we, some of us are worshiping out of obedience to God. We feel like uh, we read scripture and we're convicted that part of our income goes to the church of Jesus. And for those of you who tithe and who give regularly, thank you. Uh, you're helping the mission of our church move forward. And the mission of our church is really deeply rooted in being a place of hope for, for everybody in town and around the world. And if you want to learn more about that, there's, there's hope booklets in the seat in front of you. Also on our website and on our app, you can read all about our hope fund. Uh, those are the things that we are excited to invest in. A couple of reports. Uh, over Easter, we um, received an offering for Convoy of Hope's One Day to Feed the World. And if you'd like to have more information on that, you can go to convoyofhope.org. We've talked about it a lot in here. Uh, but last week, we went over the $10,000 mark. So thank you for your giving. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, praise Jesus. And next week, Lily Wilson, who uh, used to be on our staff as our children's pastor, she's going to be uh, sharing a little bit about an upcoming opportunity to help some kids in Kenya. And next week, we're going to have a spaghetti, like a to-go box of spaghetti that you can, you can donate to. 
and you can take lunch with you and or you can eat out here on the grounds because apparently it's pretty now it's really pretty here in North Carolina and we're all glad for it some of some of us are at the lake today and watching on our phones and and good for you good for you for taking some time out on the lake we'll see you when you get back but be here next week because we we want to bless these kids in Kenya through the Hope Fund and uh, we, we need, we, we're looking to raise around $3,000 to help Pastor Lily with this, with this effort. So uh, when you give your tithes and offerings or to the Hope Fund, this is the kind of stuff that it goes towards. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, we love you. We thank you. And we know that um, obedience and the things that we have when we unclench our fists and give them to you, that you do more with all of that than if we held on to everything. So we give with that kind of heart. We give with that kind of expectation uh, because you took a little boy's lunch. Who He gave you his lunch. There were thousands of people that were hungry, and he, gave, he brought his lunch. You took that small act of obedience and turned it into a miracle. You used our human response and brought hope and a fantastic fetch lunch to thousands of people on the hillside. You did it then, you'll do it now. Story after story we hear of your faithfulness through this giving. And we worship you with it and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So good to see you here today. Uh, I have the microphone, so I'm going to say this. Happy anniversary to my wife. Uh, today we are celebrating 12 years, and uh, we have three kids, and uh, I'm thankful for Children's Church this morning, Pastor, Pastor Nate, thankful that we've got a great kids ministry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> hey, if this is your first time here, welcome to the family. Uh, glad you're here with us. We're so thankful that you chose to worship with us this morning. Uh, we've got a gift for you out in the lobby, so if you haven't stopped by the Welcome Center, please do that on your way out. We would love uh, to give you a gift, to talk to you. Um, and if you're watching online, I don't have a gift for you. I mean, you can go to Amazon or, or something, but that's on you. Um, we hope you'll join us in person soon. We'd love to see you here uh, in, in person. And uh, I wanna let you guys know one thing um, about what's going on right now. We have these things called hope boxes. Uh, they're right here in the back of the room. And every month we have the opportunity to uh, partner with um, an organization or uh, in this case, this month, the school to help provide and meet a need. It's just a very practical way for us to show the love of Jesus and to be the church of Jesus. Um, so this month, uh, if you wanna throw it up there, we're collecting, and this is a little more clarity. If you were here last week, it was a little confusing. We are collecting quart and gallon Ziploc bags, all right? And we're collecting $10 gift cards. And all of these things that are given to uh, our Hope Box ministry is gonna go straight out to the teachers at East South Moral elementary school. Um, as you guys know, if you're a teacher in the room, first of all, thank you for all you do. Like, just thank you, because I have three kids, and the thought of trying to teach them anything is just, I try it. We tried it yesterday. It was okay, but I have so much respect for you if you're a teacher in the room. Thank you for all you do, um, but not only do teachers pour out their heart and their soul into what they do, but come to find out, they're actually pouring their wallet as well. They're, they're literally buying copy paper for their classroom. I heard a sigh. Uh, can you imagine, I see these papers come home with my kids. They get this blue folder that comes home every Tuesday. And I mean, the stacks of paper are this thick of their work. And, and the realization that is that the teacher paid for that. And so we want to be a practical arm of the church of Jesus Christ, stretching out to help give some reprieve to these teachers who are struggling not only to teach my children, but also to, to provide what they need for their classroom. So I wanna encourage you, make a note in your phone. You can do it right now that you need to pick some of this stuff up. Um, everything that goes will go straight to the teachers, all right? So you can know that every dollar that you put in on with these gift cards, uh, whether it's Walmart, Hobby Lobby, it's gonna go straight to a teacher in, that really needs it to help uh, to have supplies for their classroom. Um, so at this time, I'd like you to stand up as we kind of go into our break, they're gonna throw five minutes on the clock. And this break is just five minutes for you to talk to someone maybe you didn't get to talk to before you 
got seated, or maybe you want some more coffee. It's a great time to get some coffee. Uh, talk to someone, meet someone. We'll see you back here in five minutes.
peace of mind, yes. And we're talking through what Scripture has to say about how we handle anxiety, how we handle depression, burnout, those kinds of things. A couple things before I get into it. Um, uh, We have a special call business meeting today. This is for anybody, especially our members, who have any questions or you want to learn more information about uh, some development stuff we have going on here at the church. We talked about this at our annual business meeting. And uh, we, we have an offer uh, for, some, for some assets that we're discussing. And so tonight at 5, we're going to be meeting over in the multipurpose room. That's where our kids have their service on Sundays. And we're going to just be kind of sharing the details around what's being offered. And we're going to be answering questions, and we're going to be talking through that. So 5 o'clock today, and if you're for it or if you're against it, that's fine. Just come out and learn. Um, if you're like, I trust you, and I don't really need to spend my Sunday night out there with you, then God bless you. Keep, keep watching the Masters or whatever. Um, and uh, since we're in this series on um, peace of mind, mental health, anxiety, what the Bible says, on Wednesday nights we have a group that's called From Pain to Peace, along with all the stuff for the kids and everything else. But if you want to go deeper with some of this content into actionable kind of practical things, uh, from these scriptures, uh, Wednesday night at 6.30, I'd encourage you to be here for that. Today, uh, we've got a very exciting, engaging topic to talk about. Uh, we're going to be talking about depression. Who's excited to talk about depression? Yeah. Woo! Let me hear you out there. Yeah, depression! Yeah! yeah. You know, when most folks hear about depression, they immediately think of uh, this person from Inside Out. It's uh, sadness. Anybody see this movie? Fantastic movie. I don't know if you've seen it. But when, 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 when we say depression or we think depression, this, this is the character really that, 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 that a lot of folks think of. And it's just like this blue person that's crying all the time. And my wife, she's, she's a therapist, and she actually has the characters from Inside Out and you know, these little plush animals or stuffed animal th- looking things. And she uses these with, with kids and with even sometimes adults to talk about different emotions. And a fantastic movie. This is often what we think about when we think about depression. We think about sad. We think about going through hard things. And I think it's important just right out the gate that we recognize that being sad is not the same thing as being depressed. Like sadness happens because of different events. We, yesterday, me and my kids, we said goodbye to, to Jack, uh, our, our, he's one of our dogs. And we're all sad about it. You know what? It's appropriate to be sad when you lose someone or you lose a pet. Um, it's, it's appropriate. It's, it's really, I was talking to my son, and uh, we were all, like, crying and talking. And I was like, you know, uh, I've heard it said that if, if you've got a lot of tears of sadness for someone or, or, or a pet that you love, it, it really means that you loved it a lot. Like, the tears and the sadness are kind of like evidence of your love. And that's kind of a beautiful thing when you think about it. But, but sadness and grief is not the same thing as depression. You can be sad about something and you can cry, but depression is something a lot more chronic. It's a lot more um, deep. It, it's, it's a feeling of darkness that is like nonstop all the time. Depression kind of looks like this word cloud here. It's, 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 it's just this darkness that a person walks through. They feel it all the time, just staying in bed all the time. And some of you have walked through depression, or maybe you're, you're walking through depression now, and you get it. Like, when you get in the car and you turn on the car, you just kind of sit there in silence for a few minutes. And, and you just are a little overwhelmed by the, the constant sadness that you feel hoping that the day goes away. You have no motivation, no hope. A lot of times with depression, it's, it's diagnosed when you're incapable of feeling anything good. Like positive things around you can be happening and you, you just don't care. And, and, and I'm, we're, don't worry, we are not raising our hands and we are not diagnosing ourselves today because uh, this is uncomfortable to talk about. Not, not just like, in the church, like we don't talk about this in church a lot, but we don't talk about this in the South a lot, y'all. We, we, just, just to be quite honest, here in the South, we, 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 we have a lot of pressures to being okay. We, there's a lot of, like if you're going through something uh, and, and you're sad about it, I, I think one of, the, one of the worst things that someone who knows you can say is, okay, yeah, but are you okay? 
<laughs> like, no, all these terrible things just happened. I'm not okay. What's wrong with you? And then assault, and, you know, it's bad. But, but we have this pressure when bad things are happening to be like, you know, I'm, I'm drowning in this, and this is happening, and I cut my foot off, and you know, all this stuff, but I'm fine. We all want to be fine. And we say unhelpful things to each other here in the South a lot. We say things like, and we think it's helpful. And here's the thing. I'm not shaming those of us that say these things. I'm saying that we, we really, we have this, we want to be helpful when we say these things. Uh, as a pastor, I, 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 I spend a lot of time with, with families who are grieving. And so it's at the hospital, at the viewings, or at the, at the funerals. and you know, uh, Not hospitals at the viewing, funeral homes at the viewing. Did I say hospitals? I didn't mean hospitals. But I've also spent time in hospitals with families who are just going through stuff. And well-meaning people come around them and they go, well, are you okay? And they're, like, there's this, this underlying hope of like, I oh, know all that, but, but you're, you're good, right? And No, we're not good. It's the biggest lie I think we tell to each other all the time. How are you doing? Fine. And that's just kind of the socially acceptable thing to say. But we also say really unhelpful things like, and they're kind of funny, <laughs> but we say things like, well, you know, you just got to keep on keeping on. What? <laughs> Why are you saying that to me? You got to keep on keep. What does that mean? But we were trying to be helpful. And we, we, we say things like, well, I know, I know it's hard, but you know what? You just got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm not even wearing boots. These are Sperry's. What are you talking? You know. One of my favorites is, well, you just got to give it to God. And there's some truth in some of these things. Like, you got to keep on keeping on. It means, well, you just got to get through it. Yeah, but that's not really helpful. To how I'm feeling, and you got to pull yourself up. Yeah, you got to have grit. You got to, you do, but you just got to give it to Jesus. You just got to give it to God. Okay, there's truth there, but that's not helping the feeling. Do I just deny that I'm feeling this way? Since I'm picking on what not to say, here's something I would encourage you to say to somebody that you know is struggling, somebody that is hurting. I would encourage you to say, I love you and I'm with you. I'm just, I'm here with you. I'm here for you, I'm here with you, and I love you. And, and because we're in the South, we want to follow that up with, do you need anything? What you like to eat? What you, let me just encourage you. Let me just encourage you. Don't ask, just go get a gift card. Don't ask, just make a meal. Don't ask. If they've got preferences, they'll let you know. Trust me. But these sayings, these things, when someone is in depression, when someone is in that like dark cloud of feeling like everything is falling apart, it's not very helpful to just say things to say them. Let me give you an example. Let's say uh, one of my kids, we just put up this tire swing at our house, and um, one of my kids is, and they are getting brave with this thing, by the way. They are pushing each other to the limits. I think they're trying to see if they can catch the other branches sometimes. Uh, well, let's say one of my kids tragically falls and they, they break, breaks her arm or something. They're in pain. They're screaming on the ground. How stupid is it for me as a dad to go up to this one and say, hey, I know you fell, but you just got to keep on keeping on, okay? You just got you just got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I know that arm is broken and we see the bones sticking out and you're bleeding, but just give it to Jesus, babe. Just give it to Jesus. Man, y'all would call somebody on me. And I think the same thing applies to depression. Because even though a person is not bleeding out, even though a bone's not going through the skin, even though we can't see the darkness inside of them, we need support and we need help. Of, co of course we wouldn't do that to a kid who just broke her arm. As, as followers of Jesus, I want to encourage you, when someone's battling depression or anxiety, a loving response, a thoughtful response, and it, and it takes a lot more intention to be with someone in their hurt. Just going back to that example of a broken arm. Some of you are like, when's he getting to scripture? We're, we're going to get there. The same intention that you would take with someone with a broken arm we can take that same intention with someone who's really struggling. 
with depression, with anxiety. As a pastor, um, I, I, I see, you know, different, different people who are dealing with different things, and I think one of the biggest questions is, okay, well, I know, I know to take that person to the emergency room if their arm's broken, but I don't really know how to support somebody who's dealing with anxiety or depression. And, and I, I, I think there's going to be some helpful things that we talk through here today uh, about how to, how, how to look for support, how to receive support, how to, how to recommend support. But as a pastor, I refer people all the time to counselors and to doctors. And you're like, what? Why? And I'm, don't you believe in prayer? Yeah, I believe in prayer. I also believe, and I know, that sometimes a person's hormones they're not getting the chemical levels that they need to get, and they need a doctor. Sometimes a person's anxiety is so much a pattern in their head, they, they need someone to help them detangle what's going on, and a counselor helps people with that. God is not limited to the prayers that this pastor prays. Often these prayers are answered by God working through the help of other people in the church and in the community. So let me remind you, before we get into scripture, I am a pastor, I'm not a doctor or a mental health professional, and I'm trying to stay in my lane here. So I'm, I'm not going to be expounding on, you know, differential analysis here or uh, trying to, to talk like a neurosurgeon or a, or a brain doctor. No, no, no. I'm, there is a spiritual response to depression. There is a spiritual response to anxiety, and, and that's, that's the lane I can speak to. When it comes to depression, what the um, professionals directly identify is that there are four root causes of depression. So if, if you have been depressed before, I think you can identify with this. If you feel like you might be depressed, you can probably understand some of this. But these are just four huge understandings that exist in the world of mental health. The first cause of depression that they share with us is a biological cause. There's a chemical imbalance. There's chronic pain. There's a nutrition deficit or, or a hormonal change. One, one of the things that um, I've, I've, I've been told and that I'm testing out in my own life is that about every 10 years, your body starts acting differently, whether it's hormones or chemicals or tonins or whatever you want to call it inside the body. They, they, they shift about every 10 years. And so for some of us men who don't really, and I know this is probably not all men, but I've heard that there are some men that just refuse to go to the doctor. Have y'all heard about this? There's some men who refuse to go, at least every 10 years, maybe go and get some things checked out. Just, just, just you know, you get an oil change every 3,000 miles, or some of you change your oil every weekend. But, but, you know, there's these biological functions. There's these biological things. So, it looks like this. It looks like I've not slept a whole night in years. That's something that is biological. Some of us, we're not in the sun enough, and we, we don't get exercise, different things. So biological, there, there is a root cause with a biological issue that causes depression in some folks. Another one is relational. There's a relational cause for depression. And this isn't just like, you know, marriage and divorce or breakups romantically, although that all obviously that kind of fits into this but it's this this I, this 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 it's betrayal it's rejection it's the stuff that happened you're, does anybody remember 2020 remember covid some of y'all don't remember back in 2020 uh there was a pandemic uh, worldwide, kind of shocked that none of y'all remember. Uh, we had to stay inside and away from each other for a long time. And we fought that. Some of you fought that. And now that we can all be together, you're not being around anybody ever. Now that we can like, you know, now that it's like safe, you know, quote, to, to be in public and to be around everybody, like those same people who are fighting for us to be together, like I don't see a lot of them actually being together anymore. It's like they've just isolated. Anyway, soapbox, I'll step off of it. But there's these, what happened during all that time is that socially we were very distant. And that's, that was a, there, there is so much that came out of that year, year and a half of weirdness and awkwardness 
that we are dealing with in counseling offices and in our bodies, biological, relational, another one is circumstantial, a death or a loss or a trauma or a bankruptcy or People, some people even get depressed right after they retire because they didn't realize how much, like, that my entire life was attached to what I do every day. And there's, there's grief and loss that are not just because of, like, other human beings or pets that die, but because there's a season in life that's now over. And I'm like, what in the world? Your kids move out of the house and you complained about your kids, but you loved your kids. But now it's really quiet and there's no, there's no longer socks everywhere and shoes everywhere. And some of you are depressed because your kids won't leave home. <laughs> like there's circumstantial. And then there's like spiritual causes of depression. And this isn't the pastor throwing spiritual in there just because he feels like we need to talk about Jesus. And No, no, no. This is like verifiable data from the professionals saying one of the root causes of depressions has a spiritual component to it where every day is a battle against forces of darkness. Our text today comes from Lamentations chapter three. Say Lamentations. Y'all know why I ask you to say things sometimes? It's just to prove that you're awake. And those of you that are asleep are like, Lamentations, you know. (laughs) Lamentations 3. Jeremiah, the prophet of old, battled in inner darkness and despair. He was desperately trying to hold on to God. He wrote this book, most scholars believe, he wrote this book, Lamentations, directly after a period of time where the empire of Babylon came and destroyed their hometown, Jerusalem, the holy city. His loved ones were killed. Those that weren't killed were deported from the country and sent into exile. He had lost everything. He was depressed. Things had been prophesied about this. But Lamentations 3 is is this, and, and I say beautiful because of how honest it is. It's this beautiful treatise around how the prophet felt. Lamentations chapter 3 reads this way. I am the one who has seen affliction under the rod of God's wrath. He is directly attributing how he feels to the rod of God's wrath. If Jeremiah is blaming someone for how he feels in this first sentence, who do we think he's blaming? God. You ever ever prayed that prayer like, God, I'm so fed up with you? Listen to what he says next. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me sit in darkness like the dead of long ago. Why are some of those words blue and some of those words red, Nate? Are the red ones the words of Jesus? I heard that the Bibles have red words and they're Jesus. No, that's not what this means. The red words are there because those are the feeling words. This is how he feels. He feels, if we just take that last sentence, that God has made him sit in the darkness like the dead of long ago. Let's, let's, let's pull that out a minute. When you, need, when you read scripture, you need imagination. What does it mean to sit in the darkness of the dead from long ago? Is he talking about graveyards? Is he talking about the isolation of the dead? How on the funeral day when they're buried, everybody's around them, but then they leave and very few of them ever come back. Why? Because the dead is dead. He's saying, I was placed in my living self into the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has put heavy chains on me. Though I call and cry out for help, he shuts out my prayer. My soul, skipping down to verse 17, my soul is bereft of peace. Anytime you can work the word bereft in and know what you're saying, that's impressive. This prophet is bereft. He is, there is no peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. 
So I say, gone is my glory and all that I hope for from the Lord. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. Wormwood and gall, that's, 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 that's the stuff that's just bitter. Bitter drink. It says when Jesus was dying, they brought to him wine soaked in gall, soaked in bitterness. Wormwood is just this, this incredible bitterness and this incredible, like we could go into this a lot more, but we, we, we don't have, he's, he's homeless and he's bitter about it. He's in exile. The wormwood is literally bitter herbs and the gall is this bitter drink of bile. Some of you in the medical profession know exactly what bile is. It's a good thing for you to Google. Get in on that algorithm of what, what is bile. See what comes up. You know. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. Jeremiah, in his writing, like, he's not the dude that I'm looking for in the restaurant to sit beside because he's just going to bring you down. He is wormwood. Who uses wormwood? Gall. I'm sad. I am, I am walled off. I am, I am forgotten like the dead. He's depressed. And, and I think a good, a good exercise for those of you that read Scripture is to take the book of Lamentations and to read it alongside the history that you see in the book of 2 Kings. If you're not familiar with 2 Kings, it's right after 1 Kings. That's why they call it 2 Kings. Not even a courtesy laugh. Whatever, jerks. So, but to take Lamentations and to read it alongside the last few chapters of 2 Kings because what's happening in the Jewish people and what's happening in this exile, that is very close to the time that Jeremiah is feeling all of these feelings. It's more than an event. It's more than a circumstance. His home, his life, his family, everything has been destroyed. And we can see that, that the circumstances are affecting him. We can also see in Jeremiah's writing, if we think back to those causes for depression, we can also clearly see in Jeremiah's writing here, not only are there circumstances that are causing this depression with him, there is a spiritual component because he is mad at God. He feels like God has let him down, that there is no hope. And there are two big truths that we see here in Jeremiah feeling these ways. There's two big truths, I would say, about battling depression. Number one, your emotions are valid, but they aren't permanent. Actually, say that out loud with me, because it's important that we internalize this and think about it. Your emotions are valid, but they aren't permanent. How Jeremiah feels in this moment is very valid. He really feels it. And it's not sinful that he feels it. But these feelings are not permanent. And the second thing is this. Your situation feels hopeless, but with God there's always hope. Your emotions, your feelings, how you hurt, when you hurt, it's really important to name how you feel. When you, when you recognize how you feel, and this sounds so elementary and even a little bit goofy, but when you actually name how you feel, I feel anxious. It matters because it's, it's helping you externalize and get out of you that feeling. I've seen a counselor for years, and um, for, for over a decade, and, and one of the things that I personally deal with is just recognizing my feelings. See, I have this tendency, and, and maybe I'm not alone, but I have this tendency to just kind of go through life one thing at the next and do a lot of things. And, 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 and so like there's a project or there's something, or, you know, I, I do this at work, I go home, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, we sleep, we eat, we do this, we do this, we do this. And, and so slowing down and recognizing like how I'm feeling through life is not something that I'm very good at. I have to take a lot of intention to do it. Now, my, now, now there are other people in my family, they are really good at feeling, like they can you can, you can see how they feel and what they feel. They'll, they'll talk about the feeling. Like they're, real, they're really in tune with it. But, but for me, 
when, my, when I sit down with Brian, who's my counselor, and he says, well, tell me how you feel. I sit there kind of paralyzed. I'm like, how do I feel? Let me ask you a question. How do you feel, like right now? And, and if, if, if you're like me, you probably hear that question. You're like, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. That's not thinking. It's feeling. And that's where you want to punch your therapist is like when it's like, oh, it's not about what you think. It's about what you feel. And you're like, would you shut up? I'm trying to think about this. <laughs> so so it, it felt like the dumbest thing. But, but he, he's like, you know what? You, you need some help identifying how you feel. I'm like, that's why I'm paying you money, you know. And he, he's like, have you ever heard of a feelings wheel? I'm like, no, have you ever heard of Wheel of Fortune? I'm a terrible patient. <laughs> but now when he asks me how I feel, I pull out this feeling wheel. It looks like this. And I'm, I know you probably can't read all of that stuff, but in the middle, I mean, they're just very basic things. Happy, surprised, bad, fearful, angry, disgusted, sad. And it kind of goes out into some of these other more specific feelings like jealous, provoked, hostile, revolted, nauseated. Abandoned, fragile, loving, valued, confident, perplexed, eager, sleepy. That's a feeling. Apathetic, frightened, worried, excluded. And what, what helps me with that is like I go on this thing and I start like connecting with some words. I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, I feel that way today. Or I feel... Man, I, I do feel uplifted. I do. And, and here's the thing. When, when you name your emotions and, and you identify how you're feeling, it makes you slow down. And so if you're not as good as Jeremiah at just writing out or, or getting out of you all of the feelings, maybe you need a little help. And here's why. Because Jeremiah named those emotions. And what we're going to see later in Lamentations 3 is how naming those emotions helped him process to something past those emotions. There's a writer for the New York Times, Tony Schwartz, and he says this, and I love this. He says, emotions are just a, I took this directly from an article of his, emotions are just a form of energy forever seeking expression. Oh, that's good. Emotions are just a form of energy. There's this energy inside of you with your emotions, and they're seeking expression. And some of us are very good at crossing our arms and just kind of being through life like this all the time. And you don't know what I'm thinking, and that's power for me. And you don't need to know what I'm thinking, and I don't need to share anything with you. And I think this is all rubbish. And there's other words for rubbish I could use, but I'm in church. And let me tell you something. I've been there. And the more we bottle that stuff up and we push it down, the more violently it explodes when we least expect it. When we don't want it to. Some of us, we've got anger and pain just right under the surface, and any little thing causes it to explode out of us. Somebody cuts us off on the road, or someone breaks a little too hard, or someone goes a little slow. Or I found my kid's shoes for the eighth time today not put up. And it just poof, right through. See, we all deal with emotions. People that, are, that, that can cry and that can express it, they're not good at emotions. They're just expressing them and they're getting them out. The people, the people that I have a lot of caution with are the people that show no emotion. Because the people that never show emotion, there's a power that, that keeps me in depression when that happens. Jeremiah named his, his emotions. The rod, I'm under the rod of God's wrath. God shuts out my prayer. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down. And why is naming your emotions important? Naming your emotions opens the door to changing your emotions. Jeremiah named all these emotions, and God gave you feelings and emotions. They're all valid, but they're also temporary. They change. And we see this in the Psalms. There's only two Psalms that I can find that start bad and end bad. Like, we read one of them last week from He-Man. Starts out, I'm really sad, ends, I'm really sad. 
the majority of the Psalms like, like, like that talk about negative feelings end up saying, but God, I trust in you. You have proven yourself faithful. Da, 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 da. Recognizing and labeling our feelings, it actually reduces the power of that emotion. It brings it to light. And so I would say this too, never make a permanent decision based on a temporary emotion. Never make a permanent decision based on a temporary emotion. When Jeremiah is coming out with all of these things, notice what he's doing. He's naming these things. He's dealing with these things. But he's, he, you know, it doesn't say that he's like considering a second mortgage or, or a divorce. See, we can, we can battle with emotions. We can name emotions. But when you're battling depression, that is the worst time to decide to end the marriage. When you're battling depression, it's the worst time to decide to just quit on God and run away. It's the worst time to say, I'm shutting out the world. When you are, when you are overcome by dark moments in your life, that is the worst time to consider taking your own life. I don't know that there's ever a good time for that. But when you're in the middle of the darkness and the, and the emotions, don't make a permanent decision. They're temporary emotions. And the other thing kind of goes with that. If you are fleetingly high with happy emotions, you can get delusions of grandeur <laughs> that, oh, yeah, I make $40,000 a year. Of course I can afford the $500,000 mortgage. Look at how great life is. You know, they, they kind of... They, they're, 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 they, they kind of work on both sides. Temporary emotions. They're valid. Feel them. But don't be ruled by those emotions. Recognize them. And that's what I see Jeremiah doing here is he's recognizing them. He's getting them out and he's talking through them. And then in the end, well, we'll get there. That was number one. Your emotions are valid, but they're not permanent. Second thing. Your situation feels hopeless, but with God, there's always hope. Look at what Jeremiah writes next, starting in verse 21. He writes this, but I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. So you can, you can actually see the turn in his writing here. Feeling bad, feeling bad, feeling bad. But I remember this, I call this to mind. And I have hope because of this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff. But God's love isn't changing. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Two really quick things I want to pull out of this. And if you'll just leave this verse sitting right here for, for a couple minutes. Yeah, thanks. First thing I want to pull out is this, this, this phrase, the steadfast love of the Lord. That sounds really good. But it's one interpreter's way of translating a Hebrew word. This was written in Hebrew. It's one translator's way of interpreting this word into something we can understand. And, and this, this phrase is actually comes from this word. This word is has said. It's, it's a plural word in the Hebrew, meaning that it doesn't just have one meaning. It's very difficult to translate. And, and, and it's used 248 times in the Hebrew Scripture. And there's no one way in English to say what all this word means. This translator calls it the steadfast love of God. Here are a couple other ways of translating this that I really connect with. The unbreakable devotion of God's promises. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His promises and his love are unbreakable. Man, I can connect with that. Another way of interpreting this word has said is the covenantal commitment to God's character. Covenants and promises are two different things. We can promise each other things all day long. But a covenant is something that is held by God. And the reason it will be true is because God is keeping the covenant. That's why when we, we go through marriage... In the Christian church, we have rings to signify this covenant of marriage, this commitment to one another, because we're saying our promise to each other, we're making these vows, but this is a covenant with God. The only way we will be married and be committed to each other and keep these vows will be if God is with us. And all of you who have been married for more than a week or two can say amen to that, because the person you married is certifiably crazy at some point in time, and you know it. And you know what? You are too. 
the only way. Thank, yeah, Pastor. Amen. Yeah. Is your wife in here? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> the only way is, is through the, the covenantal commitment of God, the steadfast love of the Lord, his unbreakable character will never fail. And then there's this other phrase, and I've, I've heard worship songs written about this phrase, his mercies never come to an end. His mercies are new every morning. You ever heard that? Well, God gives us new mercies every day. This is where, this is a place where that comes from. And that phrase comes from this Hebrew word. I'm going to call it Rahamal. It's kind of like grandma, but it's Rahamal or Walkamal. You remember Walkamal down at the beach? It has nothing to do with that. Rahamal. This phrase, this word means a mother's womb. What happens in the womb of a mother? It's a safe place for the baby. It's the sacred place where the heart starts beating. It's this sacred place where life is nourished and is sacred and is protected. And it's in this womb that God's mercies are never ending. Like the baby constantly gets nourishment. God's mercies are like nourishment as we live in his grace. His grace is like a womb. The mercy of God, the compassion of God, the love of God, the hesed of God. They're new every morning. He gives you daily nourishment. He's always with you. His daily presence, daily hope never runs out or expires. It refreshes. It isn't a one-time meal under a heat lamp that gets stale and you have to just keep coming back to it every day. So when the whole world feels dark, what do you do? You call out to God, and you name it. You say, I feel depressed. This is a good practice in prayer, actually. I feel depressed. I feel betrayed. I feel let down. Break out the feelings wheel. Circle the ones and take them to prayer to God. Name the things. I feel hopeless. And acknowledge, God, I need your help. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of of sanity. Everyone needs support. The strongest of us needs support the most. What do you mean the strongest of us? Well, the ones of us who think, I got this under control, I'm good. Those are the people who need the most help because they never ask for it because they think it makes them feel weak. What kind of support do we need? Well, remember what we talked about earlier with the four different ways depression kind of happens you know what if, if if you've not been to the doctor in a while go to the doctor especially if you're feeling like you're depressed or that there's darkness you know what there are some tests that a doctor can help you with that will will test levels of proteins and enzymes and things that make your body function and it could be you're working in a hormonal deficit it could be that you're missing a vitamin. It could be that there's a, an imbalance in you, and even just changing your diet could totally transform the way that you're seeing the world. You might need biological support, somebody that knows the science and can help you. And you're like, is he talking about pills? Is he talking about medication anxiety? Yep. Because anxiety medicine, just like any other medicine, it can be abused. I'm not advocating for abuse. I'm advocating for, hey, if you've got a deficit and a doctor has told you you have a deficit, we can put our arms around you and say God's got you all day long. But it's pretty darn tone deaf to try and tell a kid who's got a broken arm, just trust God. It's actually very loving to help that kid get treatment. I see you as your pastor. I see you in the same situation. And if you've got something going on biologically, there's things that can help, and they're not of the devil. What kind of support do you need? You, you, pro you might need relational strength. You might need to talk to a counselor, not just because of your romance or your lack of romance or something about marriage, but maybe, maybe stuff has happened to you in relationships before. And you've never really dealt with it. You've just kind of pushed it down. And those of us that are quick to go, no, nothing's ever happened in the past. 
a lot of times those of us that, that are quick to say that, we're some of the key people who like have done really well at pretending things haven't happened. And a good counselor can help you figure that stuff out and bring it to the surface, not so that you can be ashamed about it, but you can get it, you can be free from the effects of that stuff in your life. Some of us have been going, some of us have been going through trauma and you need the church of Jesus to come around you. Your, your, your addiction is as a, as a result of the trauma that you went through back in the day. And you know what? You need the living free group that happens on a Tuesday night. You need AA or NA or Al-Anon. You need community. You need the church of Jesus. And some of you, there is a spiritual thing going on. And man, you need to talk to a pastor. You need a good spiritual mentor or a good spiritual friend that can come alongside of you and help you deal with the darkness. One of the reasons we have section pastors in our church, and if you're on our section pastor team, raise your hand. I got Jeannie, I got Kevin, Joy sitting here today, I don't think. I got John, um, Pat, Pat's out of town today. But one of the reasons we have section pastors is because we have this need relationally in our church for spiritual help and direction. That's the kind of support I would encourage you to look at. Jeremiah needed something. He was, he was able, being the prophet of God, he was able to turn that writing in verse 21 and take it in a different direction. And here's the good news as we come to a close. It's this scripture that we read before. It's this scripture that we've read several weeks in our series from the book of Romans. It's this scripture that I'm going to ask you to read with me again. Would you stand with me? I want you to stand and read this scripture with me, and I want to pray for you. It's this scripture from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. And reading together loudly, because these are not our words, these are the words of God. These are the words of Paul giving us the promises of God. These might be the most important words we say today. Reading loudly. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The way you feel is valid, but it's temporary. Your situation may feel hopeless, but there is a God who always brings you hope. And this God has put you in this place today, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in the room with us right now. He's put us in this place today together to be reminded of some things. Maybe his Holy Spirit is saying some things to you. All over the room, I just want to pray for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Several of us are, are, when we started saying we're talking about depression today, several of you instantly got a little bit annoyed and a little bit excited because you're like, maybe I'll hear something from God today that will help me. And can I tell you something? The only thing that can really help is for you to hear something from God. And maybe he used the words out of my mouth. Maybe he used your own imagination. Maybe you heard him speaking something to you. Maybe you're as empty and void as you were when you walked in earlier. But at least hearing an acknowledgement, a tip of the hat from the church of Jesus to depression, to feeling. Maybe it confirmed that you're not alone. Maybe God's spirit is... kind of like the father and the prodigal son looking waiting praying 
for you to come home to him. All over this place, if you're struggling with depression or you have a crippling anxiety, I want to pray for you. Would you put your hands out if that's you? Put put your hands up to heaven. In the name of Jesus. I know it takes a lot of courage. We don't close our eyes to just kind of make it a secret. We close our our eyes and we pray out of reverence for each other and to God. If that's you, raise your hands up to Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray my brothers and sisters would be like Jeremiah and bring to you all the things all the feelings all the fears all the worries all the doubts all the anxiety I pray that they would purge themselves get it all out before you in the name of Jesus I pray that my brothers and sisters would not just reach out their hands but they would reach up for help I assure you this is not a bait and switch where I'm going to have you come down and, and have other people around you to, uh, you know, try to get you into some kind of program. But, but I will tell you, um, the good thing about something like that is that you actually have people that come around you and care about you. But the really, really hard thing to do sometimes is to reach out for help. We, we do these cards. Those of you that have your hands up, put them down and just look at me really quick. I won't talk to you, just you. Everybody else, keep your heads down. Don't go to sleep. Just stay with me. For those of you who are just really going through this stuff, we talk about this way to connect every week. We talk about these cards and these seats in front of us. We talk about this app. We talk. These, these are the ways that we have to connect with people when we say amen and everybody kind of do, does a mad dash to Blue Bay or whatever. This is the way that we can actually call you and pray with you and follow up with you. But I'm not the kind of pastor that wants to manipulate someone and trick them into being bombarded by others. No, I want you to reach out. So I want you to use that card. And all you got to put is, hey, I'm reaching out. So I got to write on it. There's a little place for prayer requests. Hey, I'm reaching out. And then put your name, because we're not going to know who wrote that unless you put your name. I know that sounds stupid, but, like, it's happened before. People will put something down, and then we'll have no idea who it is. Put your name, and then put, whether it's a mobile phone for text or whether it's an email, put some way that one of our pastors can reach out to you. Because if there's a spiritual need, if there's a spiritual thing, we're going to pray with you and we're going to stand with you. If there's resources and some help you need, we want to be able to provide it to you. So whether it's the app or whether it's a card, I'm putting it, I'm putting it, we're going to pray, but I'm putting it back in your hands saying, we are here, but we are at your invitation. We're, we're not going to cross some kind of weird boundary with you. But we're at your invitation. And if, if you do turn it in, get ready because we will call you, we will text you, we will whatever. And we will start digging into this life thing with you. That's our alarm. I've got to hurry up. Okay. Last prayer is this. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, there are several of us who feel like we're away from Jesus today. With a prayer of peace and a prayer of faith, if you want to come to Jesus today, you can pray this prayer with everybody else. And again, those cards, that app, we would love to be invited to call you, to text you, whatever, and go on this journey with you. But we're at your invitation. So we're going to pray this prayer. And if you're praying it and you're coming back to Jesus, there's a spot on that card. You can let us know that. We'd love to follow up with you. But all over the room, we're praying this prayer. Dear Jesus, 
I'm a sinner, you're a savior. Help me. Guide me. Help my feelings. Help me to recognize how I feel. And to give it to you. And to trust you. Keep me from making poor decisions. Especially when I am sad. I believe you died. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you're with me. I want to be with you. Be my Lord and Savior. I love you. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody say amen. amen. Jeannie, I want to invite you up. You're going to say our uh, image bearer prayer with us. We do this every week. And Jeannie is a good one to pray us out of here today. Love of Jesus. We won't hold back.